Good evening, everyone. Welcome you all to the UBA webinar series of Government College for Women, Tiruvannadapuram, jointly organized by Internal Quality Assurance Cell of the College. Today's session is on problems of data relating to older people and COVID-19, the case of India, organized in association with the Postgraduate and Research Department of Home Science. Before moving on, I humbly request all the participants to strictly adhere to the guidelines of the webinar. Kindly avoid greeting messages in the chat box and use it only for raising your queries. Make sure that you mute your audio and video for better clarity of the program. The feedback form will be shared in the chat box towards the end of the session. As you all know, it is inevitable to start the academic endeavors with few formal notes. Following that, let me invite our college vice principal, Dr. Anila, to formally inaugurate the webinar series and to welcome to the gathering in the absence of our college principal, Dr. K. Aravind Krishnan. Due to some technical glitches, he is not able to join us right now. So I invite Dr. Anila, vice principal of our college, to formally inaugurate the webinar series and to welcome the gathering. Thank you, Siddhartha. Good evening, once again. Uh, our chief guest, Dr. Meera Madam, our former principal, Dr. Vijayalishmi teacher, and all other participants. First of all, I welcome all of you in this webinar. webinar. Today, the world is witnessing the global pandemic disease, COVID-19. Our country also started fighting against this deadly disease. A number of practices has been established by our government and health department to protect the people from the disease. I hope that Mira Madam's talk is very useful and informative. In this occasion, I appreciate Dr. Siddhara, UBA coordinator, and IKC convener, uh, Dr. Dinesh Bausar, and the Home Science Department, and the entire team uh, for organizing the relevant topic during this lockdown period. With all your presence, I inaugurate this webinar series with pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam, for your inspiring words. Now, we would like to take you to an introductory presentation about the activities of the Unnad Bharata Bian cell of our college. Government College for Women, Tiruvannadapuram is one of the leading educational institutions in Kerala, started by the royal family of Travancore in 1864 as the Sirkar Girls School. It is one of the pioneering institutions in the field of higher education for women in Kerala. The college is affiliated to the University of Kerala with 24 teaching departments offering 17 undergraduate courses, 18 postgraduate courses, and 11 research departments, with 159 teaching and 55 non-teaching staff members, and over 2,500 regular students. The college is re-accredited with A grade by MAC, and is on the third position in the state in NIR of recent ranking, and 40 in the country. Unnad Bharat Abhiyan is a flagship program of the Ministry of Human Resource Development, Government of India, to reach out to the villages of the country through higher education institutions. The program aims to change the rural India with the vision of 
transformational change in rural development process by leveraging knowledge institutions to help build the architecture of an inclusive India. So far, about 2,381 higher education institutions are participating in the UBA program, which are known as partnering institutes. The Government College for Women, Tiruvannathapuram, is one among the few government arts and science colleges in Kerala being selected as partnering institutions of UBA and has identified five villages in Tiruvannathapuram for the adoption process. We started our journey in November 2018 with Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research, Tiruvannathapuram as our regional coordinating institute. We focused more on the holistic development of the children in the adopted villages. Awareness classes, life skill training on various areas, observance of days of importance, workshops for livelihood, medical camps, surveys, sales and exhibitions for promoting local products, conducting Balasabhas, the first of its kind in Kerala, tribal camp, meditation and mindfulness classes were some of the activities that we are partaking. We did not stop even in the pandemic attack. The response of the college members towards the management of COVID was sudden and voluntary. The Department of Chemistry and Home Science prepared sanitizers and cloth masks for the students and staff of the college. The need for enhancing COVID-19 testing capacity of the state of Kerala was an urgent call and two faculty members of the Department of Botany who were trained in RT-PCR machines extended their support and resources to the government of Kerala and shifted our machine to the state testing center. Team psychology is involved in providing counseling services across the state and are involved in translating psychoeducational materials related to mental health in the time of COVID-19 into the regional language, Malayalam. Team economics is engaged in teaching out to visually challenged children and youth and have started an initiative, Praptavani, a platform for differently abled and students of the college. Many research scholars are involved in conducting studies related to the effect of lockdown and COVID-19 issues. Team NCC and NSS are wholeheartedly engaged in conducting various training programs, awareness campaigns, and online competition for the students across the country. We were able to reach out to those students who do not have facilities for attending online classes as well. The Anganwadi workers of Arikara Panjayat, one of the adopted villages of the college, has taken up the challenge given by the college in starting microgreen farming in the academic year 2020. It was overwhelming to see the kids of the entire Panjayat belonging to the Anganwadis growing the tiny green plants and walking towards healthy eating habits. And the journey continues. It was not at all an easy task for us to connect with the villages on a sustainable basis. But we have a vibrant team of leaders to guide us and support us to all the possible manner. Connecting the dots. The petrifying and severe impact of COVID-19 has shaken the world to its core. COVID-19 spread disrupted the status quo activities in Indian states. And in a country like India, which composed mainly of workforces in the unorganized sector, implicated generous concerns over the rural half of the country. As institutions of higher learning, it is the responsibility of the universities and colleges to extend their hands to the neighboring community for the effective implementation of the government efforts 
as well as making them sustainable to overcome this pandemic. This one month webinar series of the UBA cell in association with the college internal quality assurance cell and various departments and the NCC and NSS units is an attempt to refresh the academic community and the stakeholders and not the least the public to connect the dots for reaching the unreached. Thank you for your patient listening. The students of the Department of Music has created a video album on COVID-19 titled This Time to Shall Pass. The lyrics of the song was by Srimati Raji Tias and music by Srimati K.R. Sharma, faculty members of the Department of Music. I invite you all for this musical treat. Dr. Dinesh Babu, Coordinator, Internal Quality Assurance Cell, for giving the felicitation for the event. Good evening, all of you. Respected Vice Principal and Le Teacher, our guest of the day, Dr. Meera, uh, teachers from the whole in Indian community. Uh, dear students, uh, okay, uh, I learned that the whole India is now in the now watching the Women's College program. So I appreciate Dr. Siddhara for arranging such a wonderful program. Actually, she is coordinating the UBA activities, and the UBA activity is adding, um, adding, um, uh, increasing our quality of the college to higher levels, and we got. For 40th position in India in the NERF ranking, uh, uh, mainly due to the UBA activities and uh, other activities coordinated by our teachers. And uh, we have, as she said, we have adopted four villages, and that is also working. And MHRD is also appreciating the appreciating the activities of the UBA of Government College for Women. Okay. Anyway, this program is. Uh, uh, I welcome all of you, the hall teachers, hall students from the whole India to the Government College for Women. Okay, and uh, uh, and uh, the COVID pandemic has changed our social, economic, and mental st uh, stages. 
and we are uh, we are all facing a lot of difficulties in life and i hope i wish this program will or uh, this program will try we, this program will enhance our immunity it's to overcome the social economic and uh, uh, mental and psychological problems okay i wish this webinar series a success okay thank you thank you sir now let me invite dr mini joseph head of the department of home science for introducing this speaker to the audience good day to one and all this is indeed an amazing experience for all of us all of us sitting in different countries and in different time zones yet in the comfort of our homes it's indeed a pleasure for the department of home science of government college for women to be part of hosting this webinar series the department was started in 1958 by our beloved founder professor anna george over the last 60 years the department has grown by leaps and bounds it now offers undergraduate course in bsc home science two postgraduate degrees in home science extension education and food and nutrition and recently we have started the phd program all affiliated to kerala university without much ado let me introduce the speaker for the session dr arvinda meera guntapalai madam is working presently as a senior lecturer in global health at the institute of applied health sciences school of medicine university of aberdeen scotland which is known for its beautiful highlands and the famous whisky her area of research focuses on health inequalities and socio economic status using quantitative methods and from a historical perspective let us have a glimpse at her educational qualifications she is a highly accomplished lady she completed her pg certificate from the university of southampton uk her phd in economics from the university of tubingen in germany she has a double pg a masters in population studies from international institute for population sciences and a masters in anthropology from the central Univers university hyderabad she has worked previously as senior lecturer in public health of the open university lecturer in gerontology in the university of southampton she has worked as research fellow in various outstanding research institutes in uk europe and india she has many research projects which are funded by global agencies like the who unicef global challenges research fund funding the sports england southampton policy commission the national university of singapore to name a few most of her projects have been focused in the area of up, of uplifting the aged and the underprivileged she has also served as consultant at the world bank to assess healthcare utilization and health outcomes in india madam we are indeed honored to have you on this virtual platform to share with us your thoughts and views on the topic problems of data relating to older people and covid-19 the case of india over to you madam thank you very much can you hear me yes very much yeah okay so i'll share my slides and then i'll start my presentation Can you see my slides now? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks a lot for this introduction and for inviting me to speak about uh, COVID nineteen data issues in India. Uh, when the pandemic initially started, and then we had this data coming from January about cases spreading from China to different countries, and again. Uh, lots of smaller regions having outbreaks within each country and breaking to different wider regions it was really very weird and interesting in many ways for all of us because we have read about what happened during influenza epidemic 
for example, in part of my PhD, I was looking at the impact of influenza epidemic, the 1918-1919 influenza epidemic India had, and the impact certain professional groups had within India. And in my PhD, I argued that people who had professions where they had to mingle with other people had the highest kind of impact, but then we didn't have really good data. We were imagining at that point, working on historical data, that the risk could be higher for certain groups because of the way certain professions were interacting with wider world and had to mingle with others, increasing their risk. We didn't have good data. We know based on estimates that maybe 14 million to 17 million people in India died because of the influenza epidemic of 1919, which was also called Bombay fever. 101 year later, we are seeing what's happening in front of our eyes. We don't have to refer to historical books. And we have a lot of centenarians in the world who survived the previous influenza epidemic of 1918-19 and are surviving now and seeing the whole process again go in front of their eyes. So today I will not provide you any estimates. I'll not provide any data in terms of mortality or morbidity. But what I want to focus on is the problems of data relating to older people and COVID-19. The big question when the COVID-19 started everywhere in the world is, can we estimate excess deaths? It doesn't matter which country we uh, come from, where we live. Almost all countries were worried about estimation of excess winter deaths. Even those countries like the UK, where mortality data is really, really, you know, very strong, collected very regularly, there were still questions on, can we estimate excess deaths? So, this question is much bigger in low and middle income countries like India, where we do not have stronger data collection system. So the big question is how reliable all of our data and can we estimate excess deaths because of COVID-19? I would say let's forget about COVID-19 for a while and just look at what kind of data sets do we have in India? So let's start with a simple question. How many older people are there in India? And then I would say, if you ask me this question, refer to 2011 Census India report or the median variant forecast based on the 2011 Census report. So 2011 and 2020, we are nine years away. So we only have the forecast data and there are multiple forecasts and each of those have 20 million older people plus minus. So it's really tricky to exactly know how many older people are there. So we have to rely on the forecast. The second important question you could ask me is, okay, fair enough, we have only estimated data from uh, 2011 census report, but do we know the living arrangements of older people in India? Why is this question very important? Several countries like in the UK as well, there were very strong uh, policies about shielding older people. Shielding older people in a way that if they have multiple morbidities at a certain uh, age or a certain kind of uh, disease risk, they were not allowed to leave the house and things were provided at house. Again, in care homes and care home facilities, all the people are not allowed to meet their family members because of very strict shielding regulations. So we need to know the living arrangements. And if you look at social media platforms where people were helping each other, especially during the lockdown, what was the most important question people were asking, especially those who were using social media? Can you provide medicines for my family living alone? Can you please uh, find some vegetables or some kind of support? Because suddenly social care system, all kinds of systems have completely halted because of the strict lockdown India has. So one wants to know how many older people are there in India living on their own, perhaps with or without comorbidities. Again, if you ask me the question, I'll say, I'm sorry, we have to go to census 2011 data. And even that data, we don't have exact type of uh, relationship of the people. What we have is the size of the household. If you can see this table here, we have one person, two person, three person, seven plus uh, person household from the 2011 census. 250 million households are there in India based on the 2011 census. Out of those, 10 million households have only one person living. So out of those 10 million households, nearly 50% of them are older people households. And surprisingly, there is also a lot of you know, gender inequalities within those solo dwelling, older 
female households could be higher in certain states as well. And then when we move to two person households that have 24 million, you can see here 21 percent have one older person, 21 percent have two older people. So nearly 80 percent of adults age 60 and above in India live with wider family. 20 percent of them live alone or with their spouse. So this translates to 20 million older adults living either on their own or with their spouse. But again, we can't contextualize based on the living arrangements that living alone is a bad thing, but we have to think more complexly in terms of the needs and the social care needs, especially about activities of daily living. Uh, some older people might need activities like bathing, caring at home and other kinds of uh, support they need within the home, including cooking. And some might need uh, activities outside, like the instrumental activities of daily living, going to get their pension or going to the bank or getting their medication. They might need support. So all these different uh, social kind of uh, challenges uh, were posed during COVID and we do not have very good data to understand it. Then you might ask me the next question. I want to know the number of deaths in India. Can you tell me a little bit on death registration in India? So I can say again that majority of deaths are not registered in India. So according to the 1969 Registration of Birth and Death Act, hospitals, clinics, maternity or nursing homes bear the responsibility of recording events related to births and deaths. So the way it works is Every area has a registrar and assistant register, and it's their responsibility to look at the registration of births and deaths in their area. So the area could be municipality, it could be panchayat, a government health institution or local authority. Again, it's uh, expected that citizens will on their own go and inform about a death or a birth within 21 days. Uh, again, these deaths could be reported by Anganwadi workers, auxiliary nurse, midwife or ASHA workers. Now, uh, this is all very good in saying about the rules and regulations in India. Think about death registration in your own households. When do people register deaths of an older person? When there is a property to be inherited, when there is money to be transferred from the account of deceased person or to claim death insurance payments. In all these situations, a record of death is required and only in those situations very often in India, a death is registered and death certificate is provided. And very often it goes like way beyond 21 days. So sometimes few years later also when people want to claim um, or transfer a property might change it. So what does it mean? Deaths of older people who might be poor or women who might not have properties on their name, especially in older generations, might not have death registration. Then the second question is, okay, um, that registration is not very common. Do we know the exact cause of death? How robust is the medical certification of cause of death in India? Again, this was introduced in 1969, initially in smaller sections, but from 1989 onwards, this um, medical certification of cause of death in India has been a bit more expanded. So the way it works is uh, WHO designed questionnaire on hospital deaths or non-institutional deaths have to be filled by a medical professional attending to the deceased at the time of terminal illness. So again, Office of Register for each state collect all the state level data and then they send it to um, the central registry office. So then they publish annual reports. So 22% of registered deaths, I repeat 22% of registered deaths, only 22 are medically certified cause of death data. So how complete are the data? within that 22 percent you can see here for different states for example Andhra Pradesh 14.1 percent of deaths are medically certified once we move to Telangana Tamil Nadu increases in Tamil Nadu 43.3 very surprisingly Kerala has only 11.1 I expected given Kerala's track record of data collection I thought this might be really higher but I was very surprised and Maharashtra has 38.9 and Goa is the one that has 100%, so that's one of the highest, followed by Delhi, 60.7. But when we go further, deeper into, these are the state inequalities, and we know that we can't rely this data and we can't compare between states because even within states, the data are not really robust, and I can explain a little bit later. If you look at the gender differences, and this is the most surprising thing, 
62% of the medically registered deaths in India are male deaths. So that's really, really strong. So you see very strong gender inequalities. So all these lines here must add up to 100. And you see here male deaths are represented in red bars. And they're always, uh, you can see, taller than the bars next to them that represents female deaths. And again, if you look at the age distribution, majority of deaths one would expect happen in this age group will have the highest registered deaths. But actually, it's distributed throughout and from 25 to 34, we see there is an increase constantly and the highest proportion is in 70 plus. The data suggests that females are less likely to be admitted to the hospital during the end of life. And that is a very surprising thing based on this data. So again, we have inequalities. So our data do not represent from the Indian perspective, gender women are disproportionately underrepresented in the medically registered deaths. So then other issues with the quality, we can go on about it. First of all, majority of the institutions that can provide medically certified cause of death are in urban areas in most of the states. And then as we know, majority of deaths in low income settings and rural areas occur at home. So almost three fourths of the deaths happen at home, according to Prabhupada's paper in 2005, after which he started the million death study because of the data gaps that we have. So all this data doesn't help us to do within state comparison because it's mostly urban and also between state comparison also makes no sense. So put differently, the data system in India is not really good. We don't have good quality on registered deaths, let alone even quality of, you know, the death data, cause of death data. So we need to strengthen in terms of death registration system in all settings. And then comes COVID-19. Fast forward, going to COVID-19. Initially, lots and lots of challenges with the data, lots and lots of challenges with systems. But then now we can see that uh, suddenly the data has been recorded. The number of tests have skyrocketed in India. As of 28th of uh, July, just a couple of days ago, uh, totally 17.7 million COVID tests were carried out in overall India. And just in one day on 28th of July, 408,855 tests were carried out. Um, the death rates keep changing between 2 and 3%. So initially up to 9th of July, 7.5% who were tested are confirmed positive. And out of the total, 0.2% died. That is 2.7% of positive cases. So let's talk about COVID mortality data. So the whole world, when the COVID uh, death started, were worried about older people and majority of countries are publishing data by age and sex and by disaggregated information wherever possible. But do we have such data in India? Majority of uh, um, Asian and African countries do not provide summary level or individual level sex mortality or infection data, including India. Yes, the data are available. Data are available, but they're not of good quality. <laughs> but we need to really think about who provides the platform and where can we get all the data? Majority of research that is carried out right now in India comes from COVID-19 crowdsource page. So what this crowdsource page does is it compiles all the state bulletins and official handles and creates the data for us to download. <coughs> Sorry. As of 29th, as of yesterday, there were 12 different data sets one could use by different time period. And then we have to merge all the data sets to do the analysis. So on the 9th of July, 794,842 people were positive according to the compiled data of this COVID-19 uh, web page. And then from 29th of July, already you can see yesterday, the cases have increased to 1.5 million. 21,623 people died by 9th of July, and then that increased to 35,000. So the number of confirmed cases have increased, almost doubled, whereas the number of deaths haven't nearly doubled, but they have still increased a lot. So this is the daily data. As you can see here from the 30th of January, uh, Kerala had the first case, uh, if I remember correctly. So, and then the cases started spreading to different places during the lockdown. 
it was not really strong once the lockdown ended the cases daily confirmed cases are going up and you still see in the graph that the trajectory is still upwards so these are the daily cases rather than cumulative cases and the yellow line here represents the daily recovery so the gap between the daily confirmed and daily recovery is increasing which is not really good but then again we have to see what happens in the future as well it looks as if the gap is widening here but it's difficult to say because there are lots of fluctuations so we do have daily disease data as well so this is the death data from the 30th of jan once again until the end of the lockdown it was going okay but then subsequently the deaths have really increased and on the 18th of june there was a massive spike of 2000 deaths in one day in india again recently there were more than 1000 deaths in one day so the deaths are still in an increasing mode and this brings the question on missing age and sex data so majority of papers that use these data sets so majority of papers you see on covid-19 use the data from this platform i just showed they all go to the covid-19 india all researchers and um, media sometimes and then what happens is download the individual files the CSV format is available, so you download them and then you conduct analysis. And there was a very interesting paper that was published on unequal risk, equal risk and unequal burden, gender differentials in COVID-19 mortality in India. I don't want to present the results, uh, but what I want to show is the data quality that we have. So as of April 10, 20, uh, 2020, we can see that the age data is available only for 15.2% of all the cases and 51% for all the deaths. Fast forward going back to May 20, you can see that only 14.3% of the data of the cases that have, have age data, have demographic information, and also with the case of deaths, only 17% had. And then back then you can see the case numbers were very low, 112,000 and 3,433 deaths. So what happens now? Moving forward, what we have is a massive number of uh, cases here. So we have increased our deaths to 35,000 and the number of confirmed cases to 1.5. So how the quality of data is holding is a very tricky thing. What most of the papers have done in the estimation is they assume that the age sex distribution of cases with the missing information is similar to the age sex distribution of reported cases, which means for example, here, 51% of data is available with the information on age and sex, but then the other 49% have no information. We don't know how old they are and what's their sex. So in this case, we are assuming that the missing data age sex distribution is similar to the data that has some of the data, but we know from other records, including the data I showed on the medical cause of deaths data, Women are underrepresented and also rural areas are underrepresented. So are we carrying that underrepresentation during COVID period or do we have different kind of bias? We don't know. But we cannot assume that all the biases that were existing pre-COVID will disappear overnight and then everything will be fantastic and we can assume that the missing and non-missing are similar. My argument is missing data are missing in a systematic way. We are losing people that are from rural areas, that could be women, that could be from marginalized groups and from certain socioeconomic backgrounds. So we need to be really careful about that. I downloaded the data and updated it yesterday again and looked at the data quality that we have in terms of age and gender specific data. So you can see here, we have no age data for 98% of cases. And when we move to death, it's 96% of deaths. We don't know the age. And I'm not here looking at gender just with age. And it's 96%. And if we move to gender for deaths, again, it's 96%. So the missing data is very huge. So we do have lots of lots of missing cases. We just know somebody died, which state, perhaps a city. But we have no age specific information. We do not know anything in detail about those inequalities by gender, inequalities by age, let alone socioeconomic inequalities. We can do some geographical inequality estimates, that's it. And I was very curious, given that we had uh, different inequalities in the medical registered uh, data, I just wanted to know if there are state level inequalities in those reporting of age 
and gender, I only looked at present here age data. And you can see here, a majority of states have missing data of more than 99%. So I didn't present other states because it was literally 99.99% very often. So except in case of Karnataka, even though they had like a really high number of cases and 2,140 deaths until yesterday, 57% of the data was only missing. So they did have age information for 43% of cases, which is really good. And if you look at some of the Andhra Pradesh data, it looks 100% missing by today, almost 99.99999%. And then Kerala has low number of deaths despite being the state having the, one of the first cases. But then we can see here that so far from the 30th of January, when Kerala had first case, uh, only 67 deaths have happened. But again, if you look at the data, missing age, 80% of the data, despite having such a small number compared to the other states, you can see the quality of data is not really great. And then Goa, which had 100% uh, medical cause of death data, has missing data of 53%. And some of the smaller states and union territories are also doing well. But again, they had to deal with smaller number of deaths and smaller number of infections as well. So we do get some kind of understanding from the data that, for example, Karnataka in the total case as well, so on, yeah, 27 percent of data are complete uh, with or without that. So we can see hospitalization, infection and death by age and by gender for majority of the cases. So again, going back, we do not have really good data sets and whatever estimates we have. Yes, it's important to have estimates. Yes, they are really important to have that kind of analysis, but we really need to have really stronger data sets, at least for age and gender, let alone other inequality characteristics. And there are other challenges as well in the COVID mortality assessment, because everywhere in the world, the cause of death was prone to misreporting, especially due to comorbidities. For example, if an older person with a mild or no symptoms dies due to a stroke that has been a cause of COVID-19 clot, how would somebody classify the cause of death? Would it be likely classified as stroke or COVID-19? Again, if we look into the cause of deaths and the notes in the current COVID data, only very few um, doctors are writing the exact cause. In some cases, some of the doctors were really, really uh, clear in exactly complaining about the challenges they had to go through. So they have reported heart condition, increase in blood pressure, increase in other um, parameters as well. So they have really put like four or five different causes coming together for the same person resulting in the cause of death. But we don't have such good quality data in many cases. And again, how we classify it is very tricky. Um, again, uh, death of an older person with COVID-19 and other commun non-communicable diseases. If somebody joins a hospital with, an, with a different kind of condition and then die because of COVID, how the classification is being made is, is again a little tricky because if the symptoms were really severe for heart condition or other kind of challenges, would all hospitals put it as a COVID-19 death again? We do not know. And then often the disease were not tested for cause of death, even in hospital settings. For example, in Delhi already from June or end of uh, May, when the cases were increasing, they have decided not to do any kind of, you know, cause of death for those diseased. So people who had no symptoms or little symptoms of COVID-19 were not classified into COVID-19 deaths, even though they have died in hospitals. So we do not have really good quality data. And again, we don't know much about care homes in India because we don't really talk about them. In global kind of discussion, care homes play such an important role about um, the risks posed to older people in care homes. But again, we don't have much information or data coming out of that settings from Indian perspective. Um, the other thing I've done to assess the quality of data is looking at the number of aggregated cases. So imagine you have a data set you assume that if there are 1.5 million people who are positive, there are 1.5 million cases in the data. It doesn't work like that. So sometimes certain states have sent data, not for individual person, but a bulk, a group of people. The group could be 20, 2,000 or 8,000. So that's why here I just put these graphs here for various states. You can see in the case of Andhra Pradesh, some of the data sets moved up to, you know, one cell so one line could represent up to 1800 people 
in case of assam there were different episodes of them going almost up to 8000 cases in one line in case of delhi again you see almost up to 8000 in one single line so they combined everyone together into one single line so again you see in the case of goa it's looking good jharkhand is looking good karnataka has a bit but not as high as other states telangana also has clustered data tamil nadu also has clustered data and uttarakhand is again not having too much of clustered data so this also tells a little bit about the quality of data collected where individual cases are not present and data are sent in bulk sometimes with groups of cases combined together where it is impossible to understand the complexity of the data or any other social economic uh, any other demographic information or gender differences as well and then there are other cases um, that we heard about covid uh, data being untraceable for example a lab in hyderabad lost 3000 database so completely untraceable and they're not part of the data set and within the data there are also lots and lots of other challenges that have nothing to do with the data itself for example initially when covid started there was low testing or no testing because the test kits were not available and then initially there were lots of discussions about imported tests failing at times and uh, they couldn't either meet the demand or quality issues so for example somebody was tested four times and then they would be kind of having random four different tests four types three types of results positive negative unknown kind of it it was like very very challenging at the start so the data will be also challenging because of those aspects as well and also many um, people still struggle to find a test in many cities and uh, towns or villages as well so in villages because of infrastructure and in cities because of the population density and high number of people going for test so the tests are running out and then also repeat testing data so who handles repeat testing will they enter the data in similar way what happens with the data update again we have to check very carefully we don't have any information on that and lots of missing tests as i just showed in case of hyderabad 3000 tests disappeared and all of you must be hearing a lot about the rapid antigen test and the reliability especially coming from the delhi perspective that uh, lots of people say based on the rapid antigen testing sometimes uh, it false negatives could be almost up to 47 48% so the positives will be positive but the false negative proportion could be higher so the data we are seeing could be very underrepresented in case of even those who are tested they could be falsely being classified as negative because of the rapid antigen test but these tests are really really good in scaling up the test uh, in very short period of time in very quick low resource setting as well but now private labs are given the possibility to do covid testing more and more private labs are entering and then uh, governments are giving prize so again knowing how sometimes the private system work how much of the data will go into the real kind of monitoring database is uh, to be followed and watched um again um government asked icmr um, to look at the accuracy by mathematically assessing how many samples were symptomatic again we are relying more and more on mathematical modeling rather than the data reliability given that there are multiple types of tests in india we need to have a systematic way of understanding what is the gold standard versus the other tests and then think of other ways of improving our database and that brings to the next point of inequalities in healthcare in india and relation to older people when we look uh, at the data set and, uh, you know, sorry yeah yeah, yeah. Me, your um, sh- screen is not visible now could you please make oh. it visible okay i'll restart something. it again maybe i'll share yeah. it again yeah mm. thank you yeah maybe the shit and thanks for letting me know yeah can you see it now is it yes yes okay okay excellent yeah so inequalities in healthcare in india is other aspect we need to think of so in most of the settings we have the difficulties in providing the four a's of health which is accessibility availability affordability and appropriateness and this is already pre covid 
we already struggle with these four A's before COVID, and these challenges become really, really important now in the COVID period. People living in rural areas and poor settings often struggle to find accessible or affordable screening, even for small common diseases, so let alone complex COVID tests. And during the lockdown and curfews, several people struggle to get their medication, which has increased risk to mortality and lowered quality of life as well. So COVID situation has increased the other forms of risk, not only COVID related risk, but other forms of risk because of stress, lack of medication and other aspects as well. And then again, we know everywhere in the world when infections surge and the demand for health increases, the quality will go down automatically. And also, there would be lots of challenges in accessing beds. And then the policies will be completely complicated in every which way. So for example, uh, initially, even in our countries in Spain or other kind of you know settings, people were saying older people might not be given you know ventilators. It will be reserved for younger people. And there were a lot of ages-based reports uh, coming out, like uh, people thanking an older woman in Spain for uh, giving up her um, ventilator for somebody, and a priest somewhere in Italy giving up his uh, mask for somebody and uh, his uh, bed for somebody. So. It was like really uh, taken as the great sacrifice that older people can do to younger people. And the question is, why should somebody sacrifice for someone? Why should you know we be ageist in our thinking? So these kinds of challenges in terms of beds and who gets bed, again, in India could depend on socioeconomic status, could depend on various other factors as well. So one needs to look into the pre-COVID existing inequality data to understand what could go wrong within those settings to avoid suffering and inequalities in a massive way. And this is what I always say about invisibility of death and disease among poor and old. Poverty is a very painful thing. And it is very, very complex in later life when resources are restricted even for basic survival. And we know from the cumulative disadvantage theory, inequalities don't just continue in the same way across the life. Inequalities accumulate as we get older. And these inequalities become really stronger when we move later in life and will impact our health, our survival, and various other aspects. And we can see this from the life expectancy data of the world. So the global data very clearly shows inequalities within countries and between countries. But what happens to the poor people in low and middle income countries? They live often invisible lives. Their deaths are not heard. Their deaths are not seen. We don't know what's happening with their life. Even though their lives are very painful often, we, have, we completely don't see them. It's completely invisible and the life just goes on. And these are the, some of the things we need to really look into. The combination of ageism and invisibility because of poverty has to be looked into very, very carefully, especially during COVID period. And then that brings to what, what is there in India at the moment to support some of the people in um, below poverty line. So we have the Pradhan Mantri Jan Arogya Yojana, PMJ, that was launched in 2018 after changing it uh, from Ayushman Bharat, National Health Protection Mission. So uh, it can provide up to 5 lakh rupees a year per family. And the 32 states and union territories were part of the scheme and 10.5 crore people have received card last year. Um, and it might have increased uh, this year because the report hasn't been released. Uh, so we only have the 2020 February report released. Um, and we can see here there are different types of insurance models within India. There is an insurance mode, a trust mode, a mixed model. So all these 32 states have different types of model. For example, Kerala is part of the insurance model where insurance um, companies deal with it. Whereas in the trust mode, trusts are created and government fixes price on various healthcare activities and that's the money they get. So, and then in some state, it, they use mixed mode. So states are allowed to choose their own model that they would like to have. But then if we look at the main grievance from the central grievance uh, management system of this uh, program, 93% of people's grievances where money was collected. In these programs, money should not be collected at all. 
So the PMJ program ensures that nobody pays. It should be cashless, paperless treatment for beneficiary at the point of care. That is one of the main aspects. Uh, the report, unfortunately, doesn't provide how many complaints were there. It only provides this graph, and it clearly shows that majority of people are very unhappy because of um, the money that was collected, despite uh, it sh should be free, technically speaking. So that brings to all sorts of complexity in terms of COVID time. Is COVID testing under um, Ayushman Bharat scheme or not? Health insurance uh, cover pays or not? So for example, government said on the 4th of April that COVID-19 test and treatment is under the Ayushman Bharat scheme. But then from 4th of April to the July 10, some of the states haven't said anything. For, in, for instance, in the case of Andhra, only on the 10th of Ju uh, July, the hospital list that would provide Arogya Shri were released. So the Arogya Shri is part of the same Ayushman Bharat scheme, so they should have released it, but they haven't released straight after the government report. So there was a lot of confusion, and different states announced it at different timings, and people did not know. So private hospitals did not admit, did not do testing, did not do sometimes, you know, uh, admission of people under the schemes because they were not sure if the governments will pay. So the state government sometimes came very late to say that, yes, we would pay. And again, um, if you look at the data up until May 20, I couldn't find the latest data. Only 2,132 were treated for COVID under this scheme. So not many people were being treated, given that there were 10.5 million cardholders at least and might have increased in the last year to much more. And then we repeatedly saw older people uh, being denied care in multiple hospitals, including younger people as well. And then it became very common to us that people were going to hospitals, but not getting. And for example, in Delhi, uh, somebody got sick in a hospital while being cared for a different treatment and then was sent out and he went to court, the senior person, and did not, before the hearing came, he died. So it, it became really complex and challenging for several older people and their families to get care in cities where the cases were really, really going up. And then that brings uh, to other kind of complex aspect that we have seen in television and really heartbreaking scenes repeatedly of migrant workers moving uh, from uh, different cities going back to their homes in mostly to Bihar and UP. So based on the preliminary data released by Union Skill Development Ministry, 2.4 million seasonal migrants returned to Bihar and 1.8 million returned to UP. So a sudden loss of daily wages and fear of COVID-19 pushed all these millions from these different cities. So very often when in media you saw the images of people what did you see? Younger men, very often. But then I just wanted to show you the data of migration patterns in India from 2011 census. And you can see that 9.3% of migrants, which is 5.1 million marginal workers who are migrants, are age 60 plus. So 10.6% male, 9% female. So we do have substantial number of older marginal uh, workers in India as well. And then we haven't really seen them very much. And we do not know what's happening to their livelihoods, how they're living, if they have any morbidities, how they're paying their bills. We have no clue. And we do not have any data on that. So the answer to the big question, can we estimate excess deaths? Yes, we can. But due to poor age and sex-specific data, the quality of data is poor and the data information system needs strengthening. Yeah. Uh, just Excuse to give me. you, uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Once again, I'm yeah. so sorry. <laughs> you need to start the presentation again. I'm so oh, sorry. Sorry about that. Yeah, I don't know what's. It's. I'm nearly done anyway. So, just one more slide. Yeah. So I'll reshare. Yes. Okay. Um. Can you yeah. see it now? Yes. 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 Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, so answer to the big question is, yes, we can estimate excess deaths, but due to poor age and sex-specific data, the quality of data is poor and the data information system needs strengthening. But there are also other positive things for all the people. The media is a bit uh, worryingly sometimes focusing on negative aspects. We know that 105-year-old women in Kerala recovered from COVID-19 in nine days. We have similar stories from various uh, different cities and states. 
also in Mumbai, 101 year old, recovered fully. But then there is a very, very interesting uh, piece of uh, news I've read about a 106 old man from Delhi who survived the Spanish flu in 1918 and now COVID-19. So several centenarians in India would have the memories of what happened during the 1919 uh, influenza pandemic and then they would be seeing what is happening now. So we would have a wealth of information from there on the strategies uh, country has taken them and the strategies we are taking now as well. So again, if you say, when will the COVID end? Even if you ask a doctor right now, we'll say, ask the journalist, because somehow our journalists seem to know much more than most health professionals and also most uh, complex ways. But on the other side, journalists have covered all the vulnerabilities COVID-19 is exposing to. So thanks for your time and I look forward to your questions. Yes, thank you very much, Mira, for the wonderful presentation. And there are a few questions, obviously, from the students. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, is there any studies related to safety or immunity among institutionalized aged population? No, right now there are no studies about immunity, even in regular population. The kind of debate is still very, very complex and we haven't seen much of immunity-based studies as a strong evidence. Okay. Next but the evidence is changing on a daily and weekly basis so, at the moment. So. Is there any gender difference when it comes to the COVID attack? If yes, why it could be? Uh, it, it is very interesting because majority of uh, global studies show that female had lesser risk in terms of COVID-19. But again, the India paper showed that it's the other way around. So again, uh, countries where gender inequality is very higher, we need to really look into our system. Uh, we always complain that it's the COVID-19 that makes our life miserable. And I say, no, 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 let's go back and see pre-COVID what was happening in our society. What were the challenges we were facing? Societies where gender inequalities could be higher might be predisposed to higher risk for women. So these are some of the aspects we need to look into. But globally, it, uh, uh, it's, females seem to have a stronger kind of you know, survival compared to males. But again, comorbidities and other risk factors matter as well. And we don't have much evidence. The evidence keeps shifting and changing as well. One day cigarette smoking is bad, the other day it protects. So it's really crazy at the moment, the evidence that's coming. So. We have to see. That's why we need good data sets rather than estimations. OK, the next question is, do you think that lack of infrastructure, especially the digital oh, infrastructure, no. is a reason for missing data? Or is it simply that hospitals are not interested in data of the patients? I think it's because of two things. We have to understand that the COVID-19 has put every staff under such a humongous risk you know they're doing a fantastic job exposing themselves doing different tests and all of that so they they are under enormous pressure to do the work they're doing but on the other side for them from their perspective they don't calculate all these data sets and analysis so maybe a little bit of awareness on that might be helpful and also on the other side there might be data sitting in all these local areas and they might not be sending all of them also so it's really difficult to know unless until we carry out interviews with people and ask you know how they collect the data if the data they have collected is the data that they send or is it because they don't see the importance of this data they don't really collect but technically speaking everyone's others number should be part of the data collection process so we should be having all the demographic data i i think adi narayana sir would like to ask some question it seems Hello, hello. Ah. Arvinda, congratulations. Thank you. Done good work. But I also wonder. Yes, I can yeah, hear you. Are you like hearing? That. Yeah, I also wonder. You see, we policymakers are making uh, so much uh, sky high remarks here. But unfortunately, the age sex data is not available from the case records, I think. Isn't it? Mm -hmm. I think yeah. you have captured yeah. from the website. I don't know whether uh, smaller places will they do good work. Sort of the, I think the again, we don't know. Mm, mm -hmm. Yeah, but I'm thinking. Again, we don't know which one has. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Achha. sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. 
Uh, because in the smaller areas, I don't know whether they will be making at least the age six something is not recording means it is really uh, pathetic. That one thing. Uh, we have done, I think, uh, based on the uh, after the disease, it means generally after the death, na? Yes, yes. So before yes. joining, before joining, if I remember well, they will collect the minimum age sex data. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, yeah. But then even for those, yeah, even for those join. who are hospitalized or tested, they don't have the age data at the moment in the database. My God. Ah, then really it is pathetic in this pandemic <laughs> thing. Okay. Nice to congratulations. Yeah, thank you. I think this is what I wanted to say. You know, we are all doing all the papers based on the small data estimates, yeah. and I think yeah. we yeah. shouldn't yeah. assume we shouldn't assume that the missing data is similar to non-missing data when we know systematically data are missing for certain groups. So I think this is what we need to really put pressure on the data collection agencies to give at least the age and sex data. A lot of limitations are there then. Yeah. It's not that easy to make use of any of these uh, data as far as COVID-19 is concerned, OK? No, nice, no. nice. And, and that is why I keep worrying all these papers that use big estimates and big modeling. But if you have such a huge missing data, we are really, really expecting things in a certain way and this massive assumptions. And everything is based on assumptions at the moment in India. Majority of yes. the data are based on assumptions. So already, I think it's Already COVID thousands of papers published here. Already yeah. thousands of papers published here yeah. <laughs> based on modeling. Good. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, next question is What are the challenges for creating and using COVID data of elderly around the world? Um, cross comparative uh, uh, data, for example, as I said, in case of India, we do have, you know, the challenges in terms of the age. So um, I've worked with a group of colleagues. Uh, from especially East Anglia, colleagues uh, were Peter Lloyd Sherlock was uh, lead author of the paper. So he brought together various people from various countries, especially low and middle income countries. And we wrote a report and a paper as well on exactly these issues. We have within India, we can't compare the state's data because every state has different type of quality, let alone comparing India data with other country data. So we have massive challenges that with the data we have within each country. So majority of the countries from low and middle income settings are not carrying out good database. And that's why we are really kind of, you know, talking about it, publishing reports about it, that it's really, really important to have good data, to have good science, good evidence based approach and good policies. Yeah, thank you, Meera. The next question is, you have mentioned mostly on the South Indian states of India. And uh, what about the data of Northeast part? Uh, the Northeast data, um, again, looks mixed. Um, majority of the Northeast states have lower number of deaths. So I didn't present majority of the data sets because most of the data have missing values for the data. So as I said, majority of states have 99% or above. Where the data sets are really good, it's the union territories. So union territories seem to have better data, but also lower deaths. So, so they didn't have to deal with massive complexities. And somebody was pointing to Manipur. Um, mm -hmm. They have reported only four deaths and mm -hmm. due to COVID. And she is asking, is it because of the food habits that the people follow there or do you like to have a comment on this aspect? It's really difficult. I'm constantly saying that we need to study more and more about food habits and the COVID because this is an anthropological study that is really waiting both in hospital settings and also outside hospital settings on what kind of food that we give uh, to people with COVID. And then we have an Indian setting. Food is not food for us. Food is a social, spiritual, so many other things for us. So majority of South Indian people, as you know, when we have cold, we end up having rasam. Without rasam, the cold is not being going away. So it's we have certain set of practices and some places have chicken soup, some places have certain other food that they eat. So every region has something that they see that that's the food they want to eat when you have cold or kind of respiratory illnesses but covid is not only a respiratory based illness it manifests in multiple ways so again the food that we provide in hospital settings at home during lockdown change in dietary habits lack of physical activity everything is you know 
unstudied, we don't know anything at the moment. No studies are being carried out as it's really hard. Another question is, yeah, what according to you should be the plan of action for elderly during the COVID pandemic? It's, it's really tricky. First of all, we need good data sets to know. Um, there are multiple ways. One is COVID specific, like exposure to COVID is one thing. So who gets exposure to COVID? So if people have social care challenges, for example, if someone has to go from external household in, to somebody's house to provide regular care, because care at home is one of the most popular options for older people, the rest could also increase for them. So again, it's really, really complex. We don't have data available to understand the risks among older people and also in care home settings. So the most important thing I would say is data collection and also understanding the social care requirement needs of older people at this stage. Medical facilities, especially in case of comorbidities, reducing the risk is the most important thing at the moment. Any hospitalization could also lead to very many complex challenges in settings where everywhere it's complex in hospital settings, so where hygiene practices are not followed very well. Another question is, um, is there any data regarding the suicide among the aged during the pandemic period as they are facing a lot of challenges compared to others in the current scenario? No, unfortunately, as I said, the cause of death data, we have no data available, but then we have some data coming from newspapers. But again, we have to remember with the stigma attached to it. Uh, very often people might not want to report suicide as suicide. They might report it as a heart condition. They might report it as other issues that happened because of so much stigma attached to COVID and COVID related stress. Families are not wanting to talk about the other types of mental health challenges as well. So it's really, really complicated at this stage. We don't have data of any type and let alone very specific mental health related issues. Okay, another question is from the student point of view, like um, how can we get data? Um, is there any authentic platform for sharing data? Mm -hmm. How to find uh, authentic data? Mm -hmm. So this is the data I use that everyone can use. You don't even need to log in or register. So you can go to this COVID-19 platform. I'm just looking at the page. I showed you so it's the COVID-19 platform that has yeah this is the platform where you can get the authentic data as authentic as it gets so it's covid19india.org and then it's a little bit hidden you have to go to the api covid19india.org and csv so then you'll get csv files that you can look into this is the best data source that you can get but also you can go to the state bulletins and official handles to get other data set as well. But then what this platform does is combining uh, all these different available data sets. So there is no point for us going to state bulletins because if it is available in a state bulletin, it will be available in the COVID-19 platform. I think that's all uh, from the participant side. And thank you so much, uh, Mira, for the wonderful presentation. It really has given a lot of insights on the elderly data and on the studies. We need to generate more and more about the elderly population, especially during pandemic periods like this. Thank you so much for your valuable time and for your patience in answering all the questions. And thank you so much. Thank you. It's my pleasure. And thanks for all the really interesting questions. So keep sharing the questions if you have any questions or if you have better data, always get in touch with me. Aravinda.guntupalli at abdn.ac.uk or if you type my name, you'll find my email address. <laughs> so. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. So to my turn. On behalf of Government College for Women, UBSL, the College IQAC, and the Department of Home Science, I express my sincere gratitude to all those who joined us today for this webinar.